Well, good morning, everyone. Today, we're going to be discussing looking at material balances that involve chemical reactions. So, this is going to be mainly looking at um, section 4.7, I believe, in the text. At least in the third edition, it might be a different section in the fourth. But before I begin, are there any questions over previous material or homework thus far? If not, I'll go ahead and get started. So, the key things to consider when we're looking at a material balance, particularly when it involves a chemical reaction, is to understand that some of the assumptions that we've been making thus far are no longer valid, particularly when it comes to the generation and consumption terms. So if I write my generalized material balance expression as I've shown here, I can no longer consider my generation and consumption terms to be zero. I'll say when dealing with chemical reactions. And so, and, and I'll kind of put an asterisk or a note here, and it's, you know, particularly when we're looking at component balances. Now, even if I have a chemical reaction, if I have a process and I have 300 kilograms per hour going in, I'm still going to have 300 kilograms per hour going out if we're at steady state, irregardless of whether there's a chemical reaction or not. All right, so the overall mass balance must hold. However, you know, and this is where you have to be really careful. If you do think, if things are written in terms of moles, then you can have situations where your, you know, molar balance is going to be different because of those um, chemical reactions. So I could say, you know, my mole balance is it isn't going to be valid or useful. Look when looking at things globally. So some, you know, in, important concepts to consider when you start looking at processes and material balances um, that involve chemical reactions. <clears throat> 
So a big thing that's going that we're going to have to really rely on is our chemical stoichiometry. Right, and that just simply says, you know, for, you know, a given reaction, what are the necessary molar equivalents that are going to react to form our products from our reagents or inputs? For example, this equation here, we have sulfur dioxide reacting with oxygen to form some sulfate molecules. And so it's important to consider essentially how we can look at this system in general. And so, a, you know, a big step that you want to consider when doing a material balance with a chemical reaction is to ensure that your stoichiometric equation is balanced. So you can do a, you know, an, an atomic balance over the chemical reaction and make sure that everything comes out properly. You know, for example, for the one above, You can do a balance over sulfur, and you can see 2s on one side, and there's 2s on the other. In terms of oxygen, I see four oxygens on one side, and there's, excuse me, six oxygens, and there's six on the other. So everything's balanced. And you can see that you have this ratio in terms of these reaction involving two sulfurs and six oxygen atoms. So let's look at this equation and look at it a little further. Let's say I have this reaction occurring in my system. And let's say I have three moles of SO2 going to one mole, reacting with one mole of O2. And I'm going to say that I'm going to have zero moles of oxygen in my output, such that all of the oxygen is going to react in this process. Well, I can look at things in terms of limiting and excess reagents. Where in the case here, for a limiting reagent, it would be, you know, the reactant that would, would run out if this reaction were to go to completion. Meaning, if based on your feed and your reactants, if you were able to consume all of one of the reactants within your reaction, what would be uh, consumed first? That would be your limiting reagent. Well, in the case above, since I have three moles of SO2 going in and one mole of O2 going in, I can consume all of my oxygen and I would still have SO2 left over. Meaning for the example above, For the above example, oxygen is my limiting reagent. 
and my excess reagent would be SO2. And an excess reagent are the reactants that remain once the limiting reagent has been consumed. So we have a limiting reagent, excess reagent. And we can also consider things in terms of a fractional and percentage excess. of a reagent. Where I can define a fractional excess as the number of moles of a particular process and a particular process that's fed into it minus the number of moles that are required to consume my limiting reagent over the number of moles fed. So for example, if I wanted to look at what's the fractional excess of SO2 in this reaction above, I can say that fractional excess is, well, I have three moles fed minus, in order to consume all the oxygen, I need two moles over three moles. So in this case, my fractional excess is one third. And if I wanted to do it as a percentage, You just multiply that by 100 and say I have a 33% uh, molar excess of SO2. I have a question. Yes, Mitchie, go ahead. On the notes, it says moles feed minus mole stoichiometry over mole stoichiometry. Would it be three minus two over two, since the stoichiometric stoichiometric amount used is two? Uh, you are correct. I apologize. Thank you for pointing that out. So it would be a fifty percent molar excess because I have fifty percent more than what I need. That makes a lot more sense. Thank you. And so in this case, we have we actually do have a fifty percent molar excess. And it's important to kind of know how this works because, you know, in that I can have that same process where I have SO2. Here, I'll clean this up. I'm going, I'm being sloppy. SO2, O2, SO3. I can say I have, you know, one mole of O2. And I could tell you that this is the limiting reagent. And then I can say I have 50% molar excess of SO2. And from that, you can also find out that doing the calculation, you have three moles of SO2. So it's another way of specifying uh, molar inputs around a limiting reagent. Um, it's not used nearly as common in terms of just general reactions. It will come into greater play when we start talking about combustion reactions tomorrow. But do keep in mind that that is one way that we can specify molar inputs to a process. Here, I'll correct this too. Any questions 
on those things thus far. One last thing we can talk about is conversion of reagents as both a fraction and as a percentage. So for example, with this 50% molar excess of SO2, I can ask myself, well, what is the conversion of SO2 in this process? Well, I can define my fractional conversion F as the moles reacted over the moles fed. meaning I'd have two moles reacted over three moles fed into the process. So in this case, my fractional conversion would be 0.67 or I'd have a 67% conversion of SO2. So let's take a look at another example. If I have a reaction that looks like this, 3A plus 2B going to 3C, and if I have 10 moles of A reacting with 12 moles of B, what is my limiting reagent? Who wants to take a guess? Would it be A? Well, let's take a look. So if A is the limiting reagent, we would say all 10 moles of A would be consumed. Meaning how many moles of B would be consumed? Well, that would be B consumed would equal the 10 moles of A over its stoichiometry three times the stoichiometry of B or two, which would equal two thirds of 10 or 6.67 moles of B. And we have much more moles of B than just 6.67, so that is correct. And so I would say since greater than 6.67 moles of B is fed, say are fed to the reactor. A is the limiting reagent. And B is the reagent in excess or the excess reagent. So then what is the fractional excess of B? Well, 
Well, that would be, I'm just going to call it F sub E. I hope that makes sense. Equals the moles fed, which should be 12 moles, minus the required by stoichiometry, 6.67 moles, over the amount required by stoichiometry, 6.7 moles, which that would be about 80%, or 0 0.8. or I can say an 80% molar excess of B. And if I wanted to know the conversion of B, that F would be the moles fed over the moles reacted, or simply 6.67 moles over the 12 moles. which would be about 53.3% or 0.4533. Any questions on that example? I have a question. Yes. So when you said the moles of B consumed and uh, only 6.67 moles of B were consumed, so you're saying all of 10 was consumed and only 6.67 of B were consumed? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, that, and that's assuming that all of the A is consumed and that's how we find the molar excess is we ask ourselves if one of the reagents were going to be entirely consumed with some of the rest still remaining, which mm -hmm. of the reagents would that be? That would be the limiting reagent. The rest would be all be excess reagents. Okay. Any other questions? All right, let's look at another process and think of things a little differently. Let's look at this hydrogenation for ethane formation, where we have C2H2 plus 2H2 forms C2H6. And let's say I've got a process that looks like this. I like putting the reaction in the middle. Keeps reminds me that I'm dealing with reactions and not just a straight up material balance. And let's, let's see how much do we want. Let's say I have 100 moles per second of C2H2 and 150 moles per second of H2 going into the process. And I want to get an idea of my output flow rates. But I don't know how far this reaction is going to proceed. Now I can assume that it will proceed such that the limiting reagent will be entirely consumed, but more often than not, that isn't the case. And so what I can look at is defining a value that describes 
how far the reaction proceeds. in my process. And we call this value the extent of reaction. And we give it the little Greek, I don't even know what that it's called, I'll be honest. I call it squiggle. If anyone wants to correct me, go for it. But we can look at this overall process as a function of the extent of reaction and write a molar balance on the output based on this. And let's take a look. Right? So if I wanted to find the output from that reactor, I can say, well, what's my flow rate of the C2H2 it's leaving the process? Well, I can say it's the feed assuming steady state, of course, 100 moles per second plus generation minus output which is what we're really looking for, which, you know, for the sake of everything, I'm going to call this the output, minus the consumption, right? There's no accumulation, so I can have input, generation, consumption, output, so by itself, and an accumulation zero. Well, there is no generation of this because it's one of my reagents. Right, it's being consumed in the process. So there's no generation. So all I'm looking at is my input minus my consumption. Does everyone see that? And so I can ask myself, well, how much is consumed? Well, that depends on this value here, my extent of reaction. So I can say my output is my input 100 moles per second times the extent that this reaction proceeds or minus this little squiggle value. And at the same time, I can define my flow rate of hydrogen leaving my process as the input, 150 moles per second, minus that extent, but I have two moles reacting per mole of my acetylene, so I would say two times that value. And then I can also define the molar flow rate of my ethane, C2H6, leaving my process. Now, I don't have any coming in, zero moles per second, but I do have it being generated. So it would be plus my extent of reaction. So without knowing how far this reaction proceeds, I can still write expressions for the molar flow rates of all of my components involved as a function of this single variable the extent of reaction. And now, if I can define the extent of reaction, then I can note all of the molar flow rates for my process. And so even though for this process, you know, without this ability to define the extent of reaction, it might look like I have three unknowns. But by defining the system like this, I've reduced everything down to one unknown. All I need in order to solve this process is either one of my flow rates out 
to calculate the extent of reaction or the extent of reaction itself, All right? So this kind of makes, reduces my degrees of freedom. That's a big part of why an extent of reaction balance is important. So for example, if I said I was able to measure my hydrogen flow rate leaving and said my N of H2 was equal to 25 moles per second. Actually, that I don't think that's, oh yeah, it is. 25 moles per second. What would be my extent of reaction? Well, I would have 25 moles per second equals my 150 moles per second minus two times my extent of reaction. So doing that calculation, In this case, I get my extended reaction 62.5 moles per second. Now that I have my, that extent, I can then solve for my other two values. I have 100 moles per second going in, therefore I have 62.5 moles per second being consumed and I'm left with the 100 minus 62.5 or 37.5 leaving. And then of course the ethane being generated would just simply be that extent of reaction. All right, so having that one specification allowed me to solve the balance and fully specify all the terms involved. Is there any questions on that? Looking at a balance in terms of the extent of reaction. Do you have to have the extra piece of information to solve for the extent of the reaction? In the case, as I presented it today, yes. The extent of reaction allowed me to reduce those degrees of freedom down by one. All right, so it's basically using the extent of reaction balance along with the information from the reaction itself and the stoichiometry. To okay. reduce those, but you would still need that another piece of information to fully solve it, right? So okay. without that, the degree of freedom over that whole process would have been one. Okay, thank you. Of course. Where did the uh, two uh, come from? Which one? The two times the extent of reaction. That came from the stoichiometry of hydrogen. Okay. Right, because if I'm gonna define this on a basis of the acetylene, uh -huh. for every mole, of the acetylene that gets consumed, two moles of hydrogen would be consumed. And, okay. and, and vice versa, I could have done it this way, and I could have defined the extent of reaction on a basis of the hydrogen. But mm -hmm. then in this case, it would be one half here and one half here. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Your, your extent of reaction, your, your value there will be different, but the outputs would be the same, right? It's, it's kind of like a basis, so to speak. Okay. You can define it multiple ways. So long as you're consistent, your, your end result will still be the same. All right, so let's look at an example. So I'm gonna look at ammonia production N2 plus 3H2 equals 2NH3. And let's say for this process, I've got 
100 moles per hour nitrogen and 250 moles per hour of hydrogen. Entering my process or reactor. So how can I write molar balances such that I can describe the output flow rates of N2, H2, and NH3 as a function of my extent of reaction? So what would be my equation for nitrogen in this case? Well, for this problem, we have 100 moles per hour of nitrogen. You have nitrogen. And I'm going to define it on a nitrogen basis and say it would just be 100 moles per hour minus the extent of reaction. Vice versa, I can write it for hydrogen and say 250 moles per hour minus 3 times the extent of reaction. And then lastly, there's no ammonia entering the reactor, so anything leaving would be 2 times the extent of reaction. Now, if I want to say, if my extent of the reaction is 45 moles per hour, I can then define all of my output flows. And then my N of N2 is simply 55 moles per hour out. My N of H2 is 55 times 3. which is 165. I subtract that from 250, and I'm left with 85. And the amount of ammonia that's produced is 165, or excuse me, 110 moles per hour. And I can, you know, I can ask a lot of uh, things with this type of problem, which is what makes them good problems. You know, I could say, you know, what's my conversion of hydrogen, right? Either fractional or percentages, it would be up to you, but I could just say, you know, that conversion is moles uh, consumed over moles fed, which would be 165 moles per hour over the amount of moles fed, 250 moles per hour. Which would be about 0.66 or 60 cents percent conversion of H2. Any questions on that? Or is it you guys comfortable with that? For the hydrogen balance, 250 yes. minus 3 times 45 is 115. Oh, did I say 55 or 55? I might have got confused with 45 and 55. You're right. I think if this is 45, not 55. I can correct all those numbers. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Just got to change all my numbers.
So that would be 115 here. This would be 90. And so I'd have 45 times 3, 135 over 250. Or 54.54. Or 54% conversion. Thank you for the correction. Yes, sir. Any questions on this? The there's a lot of terminology in this section. So I'm trying to go a little slow, but not so slow. Was uh, 45 taken as a basis? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, the extent in a lot of ways can, can serve as, as a basis, right? Because you can do it in terms of even any of the, your reagents or even your products, depending on how you want it to go. All right, let's keep moving a little bit. The next thing um, to talk to talk about would be chemical equilibrium. Primarily because when we're looking at reactions, I think the book uses this water gas shift reaction. More often than not, there's a reversible reaction that can also occur. And so these things are rarely irreversible. And so we have to ask ourselves, when will equilibrium be reached? Meaning when is the rate of the forward reaction equal to the rate of the reverse reaction such that over time, the relative concentrations and amounts of reagents and products aren't changing with time in a given reactor system. And so we can define things in terms of, often than not, an equilibrium constant, which is a function primarily of uh, temperature as well as concentrations. That's why you'll see it written as K sub T. Mm. A lot of times you can be seeing it as a function of, you know, the concentration of products, all of them, uh, as a function of their stoichiometry over the concentration of reactants or reagents over their stoichiometries, right? So, for example, in this water gas shift reaction, I would say K sub T is equal to CO2. We could do it in concentrations. A lot of times we just do it in terms of um, mole fractions. So I can write YCO2 times YH2 over YCO times YH2O. And keeping in mind you know, the K is going to be a function of temperature. So oftentimes you're either told the K or the temperature or given an equation for K as a function of temperature and you're, you have to solve it. Um, it can also get a little tricky if, for example, I give you a process and I say, well, Let's say I've got my, you know, CO plus H2O, CO2 plus H2, you know, my reaction again, and I have a certain feed and a certain product, but I'm not 100% sure how much of, of each is going to come in, right? So, or going to leave my reactor, excuse me. So let's say I have one mole of CO coming in. I have two moles of H2O, and I have no idea what the products are going to look like. But I can say if this is going to proceed to equilibrium, or if the reaction proceeds to equilibrium, and 
at, let's see, t equals 1250k. k sub t, I'll be really simple and just say it's equal to one. I can write an expression that describes the equilibrium as a function of the extent of reaction. So how would that look? Well, I could say, well, what is going to be the mole fraction of CO in my system as the reaction proceeds? Well, that's gonna look like I started with one mole of CO and as it gets consumed by my basis now of that extent of reaction, it's gonna look like that, but it's as a mole fraction. So I have to ask, put it in terms of the total moles, which in this case would be three moles, because even though two moles are gonna be consumed, two moles are also gonna be produced. So the total number of moles in this system is not gonna change. Now you have to be careful if, for example, there was a, a two here in the stoichiometry and two moles were gonna be consumed and three moles were gonna be produced, then this denominator here of three moles would also be a function of the state of the extent of reaction. But for the example here, it's not. I can also write it in terms of my H2O and say, well, I have two moles of H2O minus anything that reacts over the three moles in the system. And then I can write this for all parties involved, right? The CO2, there's nothing coming in. Anything that's produced as a function of that extent of reaction over the three moles is gonna be the mole fraction. And then finally for H2, it's the same thing, extent of reaction over three moles. So now I've defined all the mole fractions for each of my species, and I can plug it in to that equilibrium expression that I have here. And I can say k sub t equals one, which equals the mole fractions of the products, squiggle over three times squiggle over three over two moles minus squiggle times one mole minus squiggle all over three. So I can get rid of all the three since everything's over a three and I can just have the extent of reaction squared over two minus the extent of reaction times one minus the extent of reaction. So now I have one equation and one unknown, which means even though it's a quadratic, it can still be solved. And so if you solve this, we find that the extent of reaction is approximately 0.67 moles, which means the mole fractions in the output are 0.11. For H2O, we have 0.44. For CO2, we get 0.22. And for hydrogen, we also get 0.22, right? So now I have the mole fractions, just simply looking at the equilibrium co uh, concentration equations as a function of mole fractions. So using that equation, as well as um, the extent of reaction, we, you can solve those types of problems knowing very little information. I know I went that through that uh, pretty quickly. Um, are there any questions on that? Where does the temperature come into play with that? As not a whole lot here, but if, if I wanted to, I could say K sub T 
is equal to y co2 y h2 over y co y h2o which equals 5 t squared plus 4.3 t minus 12 something like that there could be another equation here and I could basically give you the temperature. You can solve for what K would be. And then once you have K, you can then do the extent of reaction um, analysis to solve for the mole fractions, so, if, if that makes sense. A lot of times um, for the types of problems we're gonna look at, I'm not gonna make you do that extra step. You might have to in the homework, but for an exam, I'll probably just give you the K but keep in mind, it, that's usually where it comes from. There's, there's another empirical equation that we've kind of hidden. All righty. To describe that K as a function of T. Thank you. Yeah. Um, a couple things that I like to, to, to note in these types of problems is this concept, because we're looking at chemical processes And so a lot of times I see students getting confused between the concept of equilibrium and kinetics, particularly when it comes to reactions. And so I equate it with equilibrium, you know, the problems you'll see, you know, this reaction has proceed for a very long time or well, it'll explicitly state this reaction is proceeded to equilibrium, right? And so the understood is T is some infinite or non-descriptive value. For when we look at actual kinetics, we're concerned with, okay, the, the actual timing of a reaction. And I, and I like to make this distinction because in, in engineering, particularly when we're designing chemical processes, we don't wait around for equilibrium to occur. So we have to consider what are the kinetics involved? Because the whole point is to make products and make products quickly and efficiently. And so if I have, let's say the concentration of a product with time, right? I could have zero and it might come here. And so the question is, you know, do I wanna wait around for this equilibrium to occur? or is there some time in this zone where I can rely on recycle and good separations to, to get a good enough production rate? And so, so I always make that important distinction when I kind of cover these kinds of things because equilibrium is useful in terms of getting information, but in terms of describing real processes, there's very few reactions that achieve equilibrium in a short amount of time frame or in a time scale that's relevant to a process. And you know, we're not gonna we're not gonna deal with kinetics, so don't worry about it. that's a much later class down the road. But it's something that I want you to you know kind of keep in the back of your heads uh, for later, right? Um, while equilibrium's nice a lot of times the more realistic consideration is what's happening in those first initial time steps. So let's look at another example and see if you guys can work with me to come up with a good solution. So, so for the sake of ease, we're gonna have that same reaction, CO plus H2O goes to CO2 plus H2. This time I wanna say K sub T is equal to 1.6. And for the process, I'm going to feed 1.5 moles of CO with two moles of H2O. So in the case, you know, what I really want to know is what is the equilibrium concentration composition 
and extent of reaction. So I can write that same mole fraction balance as earlier, where I have the mole fraction of CO2 times the mole fraction of hydrogen divided by the mole fraction of CO times the mole fraction of H2O. And I can set up the balance just like I did before, looking at a mole fraction of CO as 1.5 moles minus the extent of reaction over 3.5 moles. I don't know why that disappeared. Mole fraction of H2O, I had two moles coming in. for CO2, extent of reaction over 3.5 moles, and for H2, same thing, extent of reaction over 3.5 moles. So I'm left with 1.6 equals the extent of reaction squared minus 1.5 minus the extent of reaction times two minus the extent of reaction. So to solve this, you have to kind of set up and solve the quadratic equation. So I got 1.6 times extent of reaction squared over, what is this, 3 minus 3.5, extent of the reaction plus extent of the reaction squared, which should give me, what is it, 1.6 times extent of reaction squared minus, 5.6, send the reaction. Plus 4.8 equals the extent reaction. Subtract that over and you get 0.6. Extend the reaction squared minus 5.6. Extend the reaction plus 4.8 equals zero. So if you got a quad solver, you can plug that in. See how far we get. Let's see if I can look one up really quick and get to a solution. All right. So, what are our roots? Point six. negative 5.6 and 4.8. So I get 0.955 for my extent of reaction, plugging that in. That means Y of CO equals 1.5 minus 
five divided by 3.5, so 0.144, I have H2O. It's 0.287, Y of CO2. And Y of H2O are the same at about 0.284. Or 0.2, yeah, 0.284. So any questions on that? What would your denominator look like if you did have a coefficient with the products? That's a really good question. So let, we could take a look at that, where the, the number of moles changes in the problem. So yeah, let's, I'm going to, I can make one up really quick. Excuse me. So let's say I had 2A plus B goes to 3C plus 2D, where I start with three moles on this side and I end with five moles here. So the number of moles are increasing. Therefore, my molar fraction products and, and my reagents will be different as the reaction proceeds. So I can have, you know, a n minus, you know, two times extended reaction. But as that number changes, the number of moles will be a function of these two relative values. So I would have whatever is my total moles initially. Right? But in this case, I'm increasing by a factor of five times three times extent of reaction. Right? So by that factor five thirds, the number of moles in the, in the system is increasing. So you would do it that way. And vice versa, if the number of moles is decreasing, you would change that sign accordingly. If it was the other way around, five moles here, three moles here, this would be minus three-fifths. What would you define as your extent of reaction in that case? Uh, I, and this one, I'm still doing a basis. I think the basis is on B because it, it's values one. Okay. But it, it really just depends on how you want to define it, so long as you're consistent. I usually just do it to whatever uh, component has a, a one in its stoichiometric place, just so I, I just rely on the coefficients to keep me organized. Because I don't like to deal with fractions at all, if, if at all possible, because these things get, I get confused. So that's just my personal preference, but it really doesn't matter too much how you define it, so long as you're consistent as you do your develop your solution. All right, I think this is a really good stopping point. So I think tomorrow we'll keep, we'll finish up this discussion on reactions, looking at systems with multiple reactions, talk about yields and selectivity,
and then get into some combustion and then whatever we don't finish, we'll finish on Friday while working some examples. But any last minute questions? All right, if not, um, you guys take care. Have a great rest of your day. I'll be online this afternoon uh, to answer any questions over homework. Um, one quick reminder, the second quiz is due tonight at midnight, so be sure to make sure you've read through um, the sections that I've identified. I believe it's through this reaction discussion, um, and you complete that quiz. Take care, guys, and have a great day. Have a good day. You too.